One of the shortcomings of Java is its relatively large footprint compared to languages like C++ and Go. However, it's possible to reuse the memory usage of Java applications, which is the goal of this module. There are many benefits to minimizing the amount of memory used by a Java application, one of which is the resulting decrease in garbage collection activities. GC events are kicked off when an area of the heap starts to experience memory pressure, i.e. starts to fill up. And as a result of garbage collection, we have both GC pauses that reduce the latency of the application, and background GC thread activity that reduces the application throughput. So in addition to GC tuning, or maybe instead of GC tuning, one of the ways we can improve application performance is by mitigating memory pressure in the first place. There are other benefits to reducing the amount of memory used by a Java application. One is that with an application taking up a smaller memory footprint, more of the application's instructions and data are able to fit in RAM and in the CPU caches, allowing it to run faster. Also, the less data a CPU has to move around in memory, the faster it can perform. And finally, having a smaller memory footprint allows you to make better use of your hardware and can result in monetary savings. To get started on reducing the memory footprint of Java applications, let's understand the size of Java objects in memory. In Java, we have primitive types and object types. All eight primitive types have set sizes. Booleans and bytes use up one byte. Chars and shorts take up two. Ints and floats take up four bytes. And longs and doubles are eight bytes in size. On the other hand, when it comes to sizing objects, a distinction needs to be made as to whether you're talking about the shallow size, the deep size, or the retained size of the object. The shallow size of an object is the size of the object itself. If the object has references to other objects, the size of the other objects are not included in the calculation just the size of the references. Whereas, the deep size of the object includes both the size of the object and the size of all referenced objects. The retained size is the same as the deep size, with the notable exception that if a reference object is shared with other objects, then its size is excluded from the calculation. To get the shallow size of an object, you would need to add up the size of the object header with the size of the fields. In a 64-bit hotspot JVM, the object header is 12 bytes, and then each field is sized according to its type. If the field is a reference to another object, then the reference is either 4 bytes, if the heap is 32 gigabytes or lower, or 8 bytes, if the heap is greater than 32 gigs. Java types are aligned into 8-byte segments in memory. Therefore, both class A and class B on your screen will take up 16 bytes of memory. Even though class A only has an object header of 12 bytes, these 12 bytes will require two 8-byte segments. The remaining unused 4 bytes from the second segment will be filled up with padding. In class B, the remaining 4 bytes are used up by the integer. If we add a second field to class B, let's say a string, its shallow size goes up to 24 bytes, due to the 4-byte object reference plus the padding to make up the rest of the 8-byte segment. If the size of the string object is 96 bytes, then the deep size of object B is 120. Because the majority of the heap is consumed by objects, managing object sizes is an important consideration in saving memory. For example, if you can reduce the size of an object that takes up 40% of the heap by 25%, the results would be a 10% reduction in memory consumption. In this module, we'll start out learning about techniques for reducing object size. We'll then discuss ways to cut down on unnecessary object creation. We'll take a look at string management best practices. And then we'll end the module with a discussion on releasing objects that are no longer needed. The most obvious way to reduce object size is to get rid of fields you're not using. In this employee class, if I never use this list, then I'm just wasting 16 bytes of memory for each empty instance. I may even use a non-default constructor, or I may populate the list with values, but still never read it. And in that case, I'm wasting even more space than just 16 bytes. So ensuring that you have only fields that are needed or used is the first step in reducing object size. The next step will be correctly sizing the data type to the range of values that it'll actually or reasonably hold. I call this right sizing. Byte variables can hold a range of values from negative 127 to 128, shorts from negative 32,000 to positive 32,000, ints from negative 2.14 billion to positive 2.14 billion, and longs from negative 9.22 quintillion to positive 9.22 quintillion. If you have a field that represents a person's age, then instead of using an integer to represent the age, you could use a short instead. And if you have a variable that encodes the state of a process in which there are 12 possible states, you can also replace that integer with a byte value. Replacing larger data types with smaller ones can help minimize the memory footprint of an application, particularly in frequently used class objects. 
In the example here, I've managed to cut down my object shallow size from 48 bytes to 24 bytes, a 50% reduction. Right sizing can also be applied not just to primitive types, but object types as well. For example, if you need a date with only a year, month, and day, you can choose to go with the Java date or local date objects, which are 24 bytes and 32 bytes in size respectively, or you can simply use a long to represent the number of seconds or milliseconds since the Unix epoch, which only costs 8 bytes, which is one-fourth the size of a local date. Then if you need to do some date math, you can write a method that converts the long into a date, does the calculation, and returns only the primitive type needed. This method can be optimized by the J compiler to not create any further objects in the heap. If the date is just for reference, and you don't need to do any date math, you can even represent it as a formatted integer, which is 4 bytes instead of 8. And to get the individual components of the date, you can do some modulo and integer division operations. Another example of right-sizing object types is the Big Decimal class. The primary benefit of the Big Decimal class is that it helps you solve rounding issues when dealing with floating point numbers. However, Big Decimal objects are 32 bytes in shallow size alone. If your application does not require absolute precision on floating point numbers, then you can use 4 byte floats or 8 byte doubles and then use the math.round method when needed. Another alternative if you're dealing with currency but want to avoid using big decimals is to use an int or a long to hold the lowest currency unit. For example, having the value of an item in cents not dollars. This then allows you to do addition, subtraction, and multiplication without floating point concerns. Of course, if you're doing division or multiplying with fractions, then these concerns come back. So as you can see, Using more primitive types and fewer object types wherever possible is desirable. This includes preferring a linked list over an array list, as each node of the linked list takes up 24 bytes as opposed to 4 byte references in the array list array. Two situations that often leads developers to use the object versions of primitives is when a collections class is used or if a variable can have a valid unset state. For the case where we need to use objects in collections, if this is becoming a performance bottleneck, then you can look into using an alternative collections library that allows the use of primitives like FastUtil or Trove. And for the case of the unset state, you can use a sentinel value like negative 1 to denote that the field has not been set. The last tip in this clip is that if you have an array of booleans representing a set of flags, instead of representing them with booleans which take up a byte each, you can represent them with a bit set in which each boolean takes up only a bit. You can then use the bit sets get, set, clear and flip methods to read and manipulate the bits. You can even manipulate the entire bit set using logical functions like AND, AND NOT, OR, and XOR. Keep in mind that there are always trade-offs when it comes to performance optimization. The trade-offs could be between memory and CPU utilization, or between performance and usability, for example. And the choice of whether to implement a particular optimization or not hinges on the combination of hardware, software, and human factors. In addition to reducing object size, it's also beneficial to limit object creation when multiple copies of a particular object are not needed. A common example of this is a situation in which you have a method that returns a result object, and you need to return an object that signifies nulls or an empty result. One way to do this is to return a null, but if you wisely want to avoid returning nulls, then one approach would be to return an empty object. What is then expected is that the calling code reads the object's values, checks that the values are set and reacts appropriately if not. The problem with this implementation though is that for every invocation that results in this empty result, we are creating a new object, which could be assigned on the heap and need to be garbage collected at a later time. We can avoid this by creating a single static instance that represents the empty result and then when the failure condition occurs, return that instance instead. The same thing goes for collections. Instead of returning a new collection every time, we can return the single static instance. With collections, we can replace this code with the collections.emptyList method. The added benefit of using collections.emptyList, empty map, or empty set is that the return collections object is immutable, which prevents the calling class from modifying our static return value. The collections class also contains the singleton list and singleton map method, which returns an immutable list or immutable map implementation that contains only one entry. If you need to return a list or a map with only one entry, you should either use the collections.singletonList or collections.singletonMap method, or you should set the initial capacity of the list or map via the appropriate constructor. If instead you use the default constructor, 
the list or map will allocate enough contiguous memory for a backing array of 10 in the case of the list and 16 in the case of the map. And since you only plan on using one of the slots, you end up wasting 36 or 60 bytes per singleton collection. Here is another common scenario where we have duplicate and necessary objects. Let's say you are reading a million instances of a post object into memory, either from a stream or a database, and one of the fields of the object is a reference to a device type object which also gets read from the stream or DB. The naive method will be to instantiate a device type instance for each post instance you create. But if there are only about 30 unique device types in your data source, then you've created thousands of duplicate device type objects when you only needed 30. One of the ways to combat this duplication is to use an interner. Interning is a method of storing only one copy of a distinct object. With interning, objects are compared using their equals method, and when an object is found to be equal to another, one of the objects is discarded, effectively deduplicating the object. Something very important to note is that interning should only be used for immutable objects. Google's Guava library and Trivago's Triava library both contain internal implementations that are thread safe and use a concurrent hash map as the underlying data structure, so you don't have to implement one yourself. The Triava library's internal implementation has been benchmarked to be faster than the Guava library's implementations, but the Guava library has two internal implementations, one that uses weak references and another that uses strong references. The advantage of having both implementations in Guava is that if you're using the implementation with strong references, and it starts to use up too much memory, then you can switch to using the implementation with weak references, which allows entries to get garbage collected. Another form of optimizing object creation is lazy initialization. Lazy initialization is a tactic of delaying the creation of an expensive object until the first time it's needed. This means that if the object is never needed, then you can avoid the creation of the object and not incur the cost that comes with it. Let's use this session object as an example. It has two methods one that uses a connection object, and one that doesn't. If the majority of the time the users of the application create a session object, they call the do something method, and only call the write something method 10% of the time, then in 90% of the cases you're creating an unused object, and an expensive one at that. The solution is to lazily initialize the connection object. This typically involves checking whether a variable has been initialized, and if it hasn't, creating a new instance which the variable is then assigned to. Note that you now have a situation where for 10% of your traffic, you have an added instruction for performing the check. However, the potential performance penalty is really low, and for the overall application, you should see a performance improvement. If multiple threads can access this session object and call the write something method, then the lazy initialization code would need to be thread safe. We can do this by synchronizing access to the lazily initialized variable. Here, we have a small risk that this synchronization becomes a bottleneck. But this should rarely happen because the very reason we are lazily initializing this object is because it isn't frequently used. If you profile your application and find that this synchronized getter has become a bottleneck, then it's a signal that this code path gets called more often than you expected, and you should revert to eager initialization. Strings are by far the most commonly used object in Java. As a result, strings have received special attention in Java due to the ubiquity of their use and their high propensity to get duplicated. String duplication is a situation where multiple string references point to different instances of strings on a heap, even though the contents of those strings are the same. It's estimated that in some applications, up to 50% of strings are duplicates. In these situations, since strings are immutable, it would be preferable to have only one canonical version of the string object in the heap and just have multiple pointers to that one instance. This can be achieved by interning. Let's extend the post object from the previous clip and add a language field. Assuming that our application only supports 20 different languages, if we create a million post objects, then we'll have a million different string instances and a million different pointers, instead of having only 20 string instances and a million pointers. To intern strings, we can use the string.intern method that's provided by the JDK. To implement this, the JDK maintains a string pool, which is actually a fixed capacity hash map with each bucket containing a list of strings with the same hash code. A fixed capacity hash map means that unlike regular hash maps, the number of buckets doesn't grow as the hash map gets filled. Once the number of buckets is set, it doesn't change. This means that as more and more entries are added to the hash map, the list of strings per bucket grows larger and larger. Therefore, if the number of buckets is set to a small size, then the linked list of buckets per string could potentially be very long and data access performance could suffer. Therefore, if you plan on making extensive use of the string.intern method, then you should pay attention to the number of buckets, aka the size of the table. 
The larger the table, the better the performance of the string.intern method. To view the default size of the string table, you can run the command on your screen. And you can increase the size by setting the string table size option to a value of your choosing. As each bucket uses 4 bytes on most JVMs, for every increase of 1000, you would be using up 4 kilobytes, which may not be a bad price to pay for the performance increase. Once again, we have a trade-off between time and space. Keep in mind that if you have a string literal or a string-valued constant expression, you don't have to manually intern them using the string.intern method, as Java automatically interns and stores in a string pool all string literals and string-valued constant expressions. If you intend to make intensive use of string interning, but would rather not tune the JVM string table size, then you can use an interner from the Triava or Guava library instead. Sometimes the difficult part of string interning is finding the strings that need to be interned. In some cases, it's obvious what strings should be interned, but in other cases, it's not so obvious. Some profiling tools, like the Yorkit Java Profiler or Eclipse Mat, can help you find duplicate strings. But not everyone uses those tools or even uses interners. To solve the problem of not knowing what strings need to be interned or not explicitly interning duplicate strings, in Java 8 Update 20, the String Deduplication feature was added to the G1 Garbage Collector. The String Deduplication feature uses a deduplication thread to analyze all strings that are being moved between heap regions and that meet a certain object A threshold. The deduplication thread uses the hash code of the string, the equals method, and a deduplication hash table to see if a particular string needs to be deduplicated. If so, it then replaces the string reference with a reference to the stored version, which frees up the string to be garbage collected. As this process can be expensive, it only tends to run when there are available CPU cycles. To enable string deduplication, ensure that you're using the G1GC collector and then set the Use String Deduplication option. String deduplication should not take the place of explicit string interning. If you know that some strings are often duplicated, then you should still explicitly intern them, because doing so is more CPU efficient and saves more memory than string deduplication. However, if your application produces a lot of strings on a heap and you have the available CPU, then it's worth turning on string deduplication. If you're not sure about it, you can use the print string deduplication statistics option if you're running Java 8, or the log string dedupe option in Java 9 and up to view the effects of string deduplication and decide whether to keep it on or turn it off. In Java 9, Oracle introduced two more string features designed to save more space. The most pertinent of the two is the compact strings feature. In previous versions of Java, strings store the characters in a backing array that uses two bytes for each character. This is to ensure that Java can support UTF-16 characters. However, there are many applications that only deal with Latin 1 characters and can be stored in one byte character arrays instead. This is what the compact strings feature does. It switches the internal representation of Java strings so that one byte arrays are used if the string only contains Latin 1 characters and two byte arrays are used if it contains UTF-16 characters. This change has resulted in a significant reduction in the memory footprint of string-heavy Java 9 applications as well as several performance benefits. The other string feature introduced in Java 9 is the moving of the string pool for intern strings into the class data sharing archives. This means that multiple JVMs running on the same machine will now use the same string pool, which could result in some memory savings. If you haven't updated to Java 9 and above, these are some of the performance related features you can look forward to. My last quick note on saving memory is to avoid keeping objects around for longer than is necessary. The most basic guidance concerning this has to do with the object scope. Objects that are created in reference to the method and that are not allowed to escape from the method have a lifespan that only lasts as long as the method is executing, whereas objects that are referenced from instance variables will continue to exist as long as the instance exists, while objects that are referenced from static variables will exist for as long as the application is running. Therefore, it's important to know how an object will be used and move it to the lowest object scope possible. If an object will only be used by a single method, then moving it to the local method will ensure that it's kept around for as short of a time as possible. There's another benefit to moving objects into local scope, and that is that objects that are completely local to a method can be optimized by the JIT compiler. After going through a process known as escape analysis, if all the necessary conditions are met, the compiler will deconstruct the object into its fields and put the fields on the stack instead of the heap, which has significant performance benefits. The other guidance concerning not keeping objects around for longer than needed comes in situations where you add items to a long-lived collection, like a map or a list. If, for example, for every request to your application, you add an item to the collection, but don't remove the item when the request is done, 
then the item will live in the heap for longer than needed and will never get garbage collected as long as there's a strong reference to it. This is actually a type of memory leak, and it can easily occur if you have a poorly implemented cache for example. Using weak or soft references is a possible solution to this issue. I won't be covering soft or weak references in this course, however, if you'd like to have more information on memory leaks, check out the Understanding and Solving Java Memory Problems course on Pluralsight. In the next module, we're going to learn some best practices for working with concurrent code in order to maximize its efficiency. So let's jump into that.